and welcome to the episode 173 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. We have plenty of things to talk about today, but there are at least three that stand out. The first live performance of The Quarrymen, the first recording session of The Beatles, and the start of the love affair between Paul and Linda. Let's start with the 22nd of June 1957. The Quarrymen, John Lennon's skiffle band, performed the set from the back of a parked coal lorry in Rosebury Street, Liverpool. The lads had at their disposal the use of one microphone going into the speaker of a local resident through the front window of his house. The performance was part of the celebration for the 750th anniversary of King John's Royal Charter. They invited, and I quote, settlers to take up burgages or building plots in Liverpool, promising them all the privileges enjoyed by free boroughs on the sea. According to Beatles historian Mark Lewison, the show was an overall success. There was a problem, though. Either at the end of this performance, or, according to Beatlesbible.com, at the end of a second performance later in the evening, a group of rowdy kids from the neighboring Hartley Street threatened to beat up the members of the band, especially that Lennon. For the occasion, the first proper Quarrymen public performance, the lineup of the band probably comprised of Eric Griffiths on guitar, Colin Hanton on drums, John Lennon on guitar and voice, Pete Shotton on washboard, and Ivan Vaughan on tea chest bass. 1961, yes, as usual at night, the Beatles and their first proper drummer, Pete Best, were on the stage of the Top Ten Club in Hamburg, West Germany, for their ongoing second residency in town. Previously, though, there had been something to break the monotony of their stay. The band's first ever recording session. The event, supervised by German producer Bert Kampfert, took place at the Friedrich Ebert Hall in Hamburg, with the lads backing the British singer Tony Sheridan. Both the date and the venue were unveiled in a 1984 issue of the recordings, but this information has to be taken with a grain of salt, since the contract signed by the band with Comfort was dated 1st of July 1961. It seems rather odd that the contract began after the recordings had taken place. The Beatles backed Tony Sheridan on five songs, a rock version of My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, with George Harrison introducing the piece and Sheridan taking a guitar solo in the middle eight section, a rock version of When the Saints Go Marching In, an original ballad composed by Sheridan called Why Can't You Love Me Again, Hank Snow's country song Nobody's Child, and finally, Jimmy Reed's Take Out Some Insurance On Me Baby, also known as If You Love Me Baby. The 1984 CD liner notes state that this last piece was recorded on the 23rd of June at the studio Ralstedt, but it's very unlikely that these sessions would have spanned two days in two different studios. In addition to the tracks featuring Sheridan, the Beatles recorded two numbers on their own. Ain't She Sweet, with John Lennon singing the lead vocal part and the Lennon-Harrison instrumental that didn't have a title at the time. Pressed for a name, the band toyed with the idea of calling it Beatle Bop, but then ended up with a more mysterious cry for a shadow, perhaps after Cliff Richard's backing band, The Shadows. The Beatles earned 300 Deutschmarks, about 550 pounds in 2020 money, for their work on the session. Let's return to the Cavern Club for a double feature in 1962. The Beatles, still with Pete Best on drums, performed a lunchtime and an evening concert on this day, the 32nd time this happened. On the 22nd of June 1963, John Lennon appeared alone as one of the panel guests for the BBC's TV programme Jukebox. The programme, very popular at the time, revolved around a four-person panel that decided whether or not a new single was a hit 
or a miss by playing a bell or sounding a klaxon. Lennon was featured along with actors Bruce Brocknick and Caroline Maudling, and TV personality Katie Boyle. John, who had recently made the news on national papers for his assault on Bob Wooler, as detailed in episode 169 of What A Fab Day, caused a bit of a sensation being openly negative about all the various singles featured on the show. Normally, the guests tried to make polite half-statements and non-offensive remarks about the songs they didn't like, but tact was evidently not the Lennon's way. John even spoke negatively about Elvis Presley's new single, Devil in Disguise, stating that he now sounded like Bing Crosby. The filming of the show, starting at 7.45 pm, kept John in London until 9.15 pm. After that, he rushed the Buttersea heliport and took a helicopter chartered by Brian Epstein for the occasion for £100, about £2,100 in 2020 money, to reach George, Paul and Ringo in Wales, and more precisely to the ballroom in Abergavenny, where the Beatles were engaged for the night, starting later than usual, at 10.30 pm. They earned £250 for the performance, about £5,300 in 2020 money, and participated to a fundraiser for the Freedom From Hunger campaign by selling their autographs for three pennies each, about seven pennies in 2020 money. Busy day around the world in 1964. In England, producer George Martin, balance engineer Norman Smith and tape operator Jeff Emerick completed three mono and stereo mixdown sessions for Any Time at All, When I Get Home, I'll Be Back and I Love Her, If I Fell, A Hard Day's Night, I Should Have Known Better, I'm Happy Just to Dance With You, I Call Your Name, Can't Buy Me Love, you can't do that, tell me why, things we said today, matchbox, slow down, long tall Sally, and I'll cry instead, working from 10 am to 5.30 pm, with a lunch break between 1 and 2.30 pm. From 5.45 to 9 pm, the team also made copies of the slow down and matchbox mono mixes and of the things we said today stereo mix. Meanwhile, the Beatles performed their first New Zealand engagement, with two shows at the Town Hall in Wellington. For the occasion, having recovered from tonsillitis, Ringo assumed his one-song singing duties with boys, for the joy of the 2,500 seated members of the audience of each show. The Fab's first show was even more inaudible than usual, because the venue sound engineer was afraid that turning up the volume of the speakers might damage them. Their second show was louder, but it sounded very poorly due to the lack of a proper sound check in the afternoon. If this was not enough, there was also quite a commotion back in the Beatles hotel. While everyone was out, a girl slashed her wrists in the room of the drummer of Sounds Incorporated one of the tour support acts. The story was immediately picked up by press agencies all over the world. Suicide attempt in Beatle Hotel. In 1965, the Beatles left Paris, France, for Lyon at 1.15 pm. They played either one or two gigs here, depending on whether you want to believe to the complete Beatles Chronicle or Beatlesbible.com either at 8 pm and 10 pm, or at 9.30 pm. In any case, all sources agree on the fact that the evening was attended by about 3,500 people. In 1966, we get the final mixing session for the Beatles' new album, still officially without a name. At the EMI Studios, between 7 pm and 1.30 am, the Fabs, George Martin and Jeff Emerick produced mono mixes of Eleanor Rigby, She Said, She Said and Good Day Sunshine, plus stereo mixes of Eleanor Rigby, She Said, She Said, Good Day Sunshine, Yellow Submarine, Tomorrow Never Knows and Got To Get You Into My Life. 
The band was about to leave for their world tour and was hard pressed to choose the album name. Revolver was an option, just as Abracadabra, Magic Circles and Beatles on Safari. Let's close the episode with two business events happened in 1968. In London, the Beatles officially bought a five-story building in Three Savile Row for £500,000, about £7,460,000 in 2020 money. The building was to be used to host the headquarters of Apple Corps, a recording studio and personal offices for the fabs. The building became another conventional assembly point for Beatles fans, who started to be known as Apple's Crofts. Also today, Paul McCartney addressed the executives of Capitol Records in a conference at the Hilton Hotel in Beverly Hills, California, talking about Apple Records and the future business plans of the Beatles. EMI and Capitol were to become the worldwide distributors of the Beatles records issued on the Apple label. After the conference, Paul and the members of the American branch of Apple that were with him returned to their hotel, ready to chill by the pool. It was there that, among the usual circus of fans, Paul found Linda Eastman waiting for him after his phone call in New York. According to Apple's Tony Bramwell, the two fell in love during the evening. Later on, the party went to the Whiskey A Go Go to watch performances by B.B. King and the Chicago Transit Authority, later Chicago. On this romantic note, we close this episode. But you have one more thing to do. If you like this episode and my work so far, head to www.simonmas.com support to find out the many ways by which you can make a difference and help me out to produce more and better music-related content. If instead you didn't like the episode, please leave me a comment on my website, giving me some hints on how I can improve. Thank you, and don't forget to tune in tomorrow for another fab show. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.